Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Uh, we wanted to uh, wait uh, for uh, Ambassador Rice to finish her uh, remarks before starting this briefing. Uh, today I have with me uh, at the top of this briefing the President's Deputy National Security Advisor, Tony Blinken, uh, whom many of you know. Uh, Tony's here today because while many of us were traveling last week with the President, Tony and other senior administration officials were uh, engaged in the effort to provide detailed information to members of Congress uh, about the chemical weapons attack in Syria uh, on August 21st. Uh, he was a part of a group that uh, provided classified briefings to, I believe, 185 members of the House and Senate uh, and is engaged in the overall outreach effort uh, that uh, so much of the administration is participating in now. So what I'd like to do is ask Tony to uh, provide to you uh, at the top here a summation of the presentation that he's making uh, together with other officials and then he can stay and take a few questions and then I've got to let him go uh, uh, continue that effort and I'll take your questions on Syria and other matters uh, after that. Uh, with that, here's Tony Blinken. Jay, thanks very much. Good afternoon. Um, you know, since uh, the events of August 21st and this use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime against its own people, we uh, reached out almost immediately to members of Congress who at that point were spread across the country. And uh, we sought their views on what we should do. And we heard different views uh, as you continue to hear today. But one of the things we heard with near unanimity was a desire uh, by Congress to have its voice heard and its uh, vote counted uh, in this matter. And of course, the President believes that we're much stronger and more effective if we can act together, especially on matters of national security. Um, so the President went out uh, and made the uh, announcement about his intent uh, to take action, but also to seek Congress's authorization to do so. Since then, we've been engaged in a very uh, deliberate uh, and detailed process of trying to provide Congress all of the information we have so that they can make the best uh, informed decision possible. And as Jay said, we've conducted over the past uh, week or 10 days a series uh, of briefings, many of them classified, some of them unclassified many conversations as well uh, on an individual basis with members. The classified briefings that I took part in, along with senior officials from uh, the intelligence community, the Defense Department, the State Department, and the Joint Chiefs, uh, I believe uh, had about 185 members, Republicans and Democrats, both houses, uh, take part. And uh, we've had individual conversations coming out of those uh, briefings as well. Um, as we were doing that, we of course were working to build strong uh, international support. The President at the G20, uh, worked on a joint statement uh, on the need to reinforce the prohibition against the use of chemical weapons. At that time, 11 uh, countries, including the United States, signed on. We now have an additional 15 who joined that statement. Secretary Kerry uh, was in Europe as well, working with Europeans uh, and Arabs, and we've been working every day at the United Nations and country by country. But in terms of what we provided Congress, uh, let me just describe uh, the top lines of the, uh, the briefings. Obviously, I won't get into the classified part. But the bottom line, uh, as we told Congress in these briefings, is that we concluded with high confidence that the Syrian regime used chemical weapons on August 21st with rockets and artillery against its own civilians. Uh, we told them that uh, we concluded that well over 1,000 people had been killed, including hundreds of children. We ran through in detail uh, the intelligence that we have, intelligence that shows preparation for the attack, intelligence that shows the attack itself and its effects, uh, post-attack observations uh, by key participants, and then more recently, uh, various physiological samples, blood, skin, as well as soil, that show that sarin was used. There's also been, as you all know, an extraordinary body of contemporaneous public information that's come out about this incident. Videos, social media, much of which has been shown recently uh, on television, eyewitness accounts, reports from NGOs, from doctors, from hospitals, from other countries. And all of this taken together, uh, we told Congress, led us to the conclusion, beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, that uh, Assad had poisoned his own people with gas on August 21st. Uh, we made the case that it was very important to stand up for the international prohibition against the use of chemical weapons, a prohibition that I, I think all of you know has been in place basically since the end of World War I. We saw the terrible effects of poison gas being used on soldiers uh, in World War I. The Geneva Protocol emerged saying you can't do this again. One of the uh, very positive benefits of that is that since World War I, not a single U.S. soldier on the battlefield has been exposed to poison gas. And of course, we noted for Congress its own strong stances in the recent past on this prohibition. The Senate overwhelmingly passing the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997, 
both houses of Congress overwhelmingly passing the Syria Accountability Act in 2003. That was motivated in part by concern that Syria had uh, chemical weapons. Now Syria has used them. Uh, we made the case that uh, enforcing uh, this prohibition and this norm is profoundly in the national interest. First and foremost, to deter Assad from using these weapons again and making it more difficult for him to do so. Uh, to prevent the threshold against use from dropping lower, lower, and lower to the point where our own soldiers and citizens uh, could well be exposed. To make a political settlement uh, in, uh, in Syria uh, more likely, not less likely. Uh, and of course, to stop the threat uh, to the neighbors, uh, including uh, Israel, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq, which, as Secretary Kerry said uh, about a week ago, are just a stiff breeze away uh, from Syria. And finally, we've made the case because others are watching. Uh, Iran is watching what we're doing. North Korea is watching what we're doing. Hezbollah is watching what we're doing. Uh, if uh, we don't stand up and enforce this prohibition, they will take the wrong uh, lesson from it. Um, many members uh, asked how what we propose to do fit into our larger strategy uh, for uh, Syria. And uh, we explain that as we, um, as we act to deal with the chemical weapons problem, uh, it's in the context uh, of a broader strategy that we've been pursuing for some time to try and bring the civil war in Syria uh, to an end through a negotiated political transition. We believe that's the best way to do it uh, because it offers the greatest prospect for there not being a vacuum uh, after Assad leaves that could be filled by things as bad if not worse, and also the best prospect for keeping the country and its institutions together. And so that broader strategy to deal with the underlying conflict has involved putting pressure on this, the Assad regime, isolating it, denying it resources. It's involved building up the opposition. Uh, it's involved a humanitarian program, the largest uh, in the world by any single country. And it's involved a diplomatic track uh, to uh, get agreement on basically what the principles for a political transition uh, would look like. What we're proposing to do uh, to deal with the use of chemical weapons on August 21st uh, is taking place uh, in the context of that larger strategy. It's separate from it, uh, but it's happening simultaneous to it. And of course, the primary objective uh, of the uh, force that we propose to use is to deter uh, Assad from using the weapons again, is to degrade his ability to do so. But it could also have the additional benefit of advancing the broader strategy of ending the civil war by making it clear to Assad that we can hold at risk things that he holds very dear. Finally, the, the, the last two points that we made in our briefings to Congress, um, along with some of the, again, the details of the intelligence and some of the, uh, of the military plan that we're looking at, is we thought it was very important to say what this is and what this isn't, because what we found in our engagement with members is that uh, many of them had just returned from their home states and their home districts. And they were going to um, state fairs, uh, they were going to town halls, and they were hearing from their constituents. And it is perfectly normal and understandable that when um, an American hears in the news a headline uh, or uh, on television, hears military action in Syria, they immediately think of the last 10 years. The frame that they process that through is a decade of war, Iraq, Afghanistan, 100,000 uh, American troops in one, 150,000 American troops in the other. So uh, we made it very clear uh, to the members of Congress we were engaged with what this is and what this isn't. What this is is a limited, tailored, but effective military action to deal with the use of chemical weapons. What it is not is open-ended. It is not boots on the ground. It's not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. It's not even Libya. Uh, finally, uh, the case we made uh, to members of Congress involved balancing the risks of action against the risks of inaction. Um, we made it clear that there are always risks in taking military action. And we spend many hours uh, trying to game them out, uh, to take steps to prevent them, uh, and to mitigate them. But it's our judgment that the consequences of inaction are much greater and graver still. If we don't act, the international norm against the use of chemical weapons would be dangerously weakened. The threshold for the use of these weapons would get lower and lower. The message to Assad would be that he can act with impunity and he'll do it again. Uh, it would make a political settlement in Syria less likely. It would send a message to our partners and allies that we don't mean what we say. And it would send a message to Iran, North Korea, and other groups that it's safe to pursue and indeed even use these weapons with impunity. So that's the case we made. Um, and we, of course, asked Congress to support uh, a limited but decisive response to the use of chemical weapons.
and let me stop with that. With that, we'll start a few questions for Tony. Julie? Thank you. Um, thanks for doing this today. One of the other questions that some lawmakers have is whether the president plans to proceed with a strike, regardless of how they vote. They don't want to take sort of a meaningless vote here. And you said over the weekend that it's neither the president's desire nor his intention to use his authority without congressional backing. Do you stand by that statement that he's not going to, he has no intention of striking without congressional authority? So I think what's important here is that, again, we heard at the very outset uh, in our earliest consultations with members of Congress that they wanted their voices heard and their votes counted in this. And that's the reason uh, that the president went uh, to Congress and because he believes we're stronger when we act together. And we heard clearly from them, including a letter uh, signed by nearly 200 members of Congress early on, that they wanted to be uh, in on this uh, debate. Um, I'm not going to jump ahead uh, of the process. Uh, I didn't speak very artfully. Uh, the president, it is clearly his desire and intent to uh, secure the support of Congress uh, for this action, uh, but I don't want to get into any hypotheticals of what will or will not happen uh, after the vote. So you're not necessarily standing by that? I'm saying that, that I, I, I'm saying that there's no point in jumping ahead uh, of where we are now. Thank you. Tony, as you, as you gather more evidence, this physiological evidence that you said, have you moved past uh, having simply a high degree of confidence to 100 percent certitude that this happened? So here's what's important to understand. The intelligence community has different levels of confidence that it expresses in any given assessment, low, medium, and high. High is as high as they can go. Uh, they will not tell, uh, tell you with 100 percent guarantee that anything uh, has happened in terms of the assessment that they make. They put together the facts, uh, and we have um, certitude in the facts, and you put those facts together, and you make an assessment, and then you evaluate that assessment, you grade it, and their grade is high confidence. That is well beyond, beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a standard that I think many Americans are familiar with, uh, and uh, that is the standard that we've been using. Did this decision go all the way up to Assad himself? Uh, Assad, uh, we believe, uh, and we have uh, the intelligence and evidence to back this up, uh, is in control of the chemical weapons uh, program uh, and um, would have, uh, let me put it this way, any standing orders uh, to use these weapons uh, would have been issued by Assad and our colleagues in the intelligence community showed in great detail the different individuals in the chain of command who were engaged in the activities of August 21st. A couple things. Uh, Charlie Rose interviewed President Assad and he said several things. I don't want to go all through them, but among the things he said is there will be repercussions if there is a United States military strike and that the United States should be fearful of that, direct and indirect repercussions. And he made a couple of veiled references to 9-11. I'd like to get your reaction to that. Secondly, today the Syrians and the Russians have announced this concept of international supervision and control of or maintenance of the chemical weapons stockpiles in Syria. Do you have a reaction to that, or is that something that the administration would regard as a favorable move or not? And lastly, you've had the briefings, but you've lost ground in the Senate. There are more Senate Democrats saying they don't want to support this than do. Why are you losing ground? Um, first question with regard to uh, Assad's uh, comments, let me just say this. First of all, uh, we um, take every uh, possible precaution to make sure that we can prevent and, and defend against anything that might arise from the use of military action. And uh, we've, uh, we've done that and we'll continue to do that. Um, and it is our uh, judgment that President Assad and Syria would have very little interest in picking a fight with the United States of America. So uh, I don't think that is likely uh, at all. Um, second, with regard to uh, the re, uh, reports today about this uh, Russian initiative, we have uh, we've seen the reports. Uh, we want to take a hard look uh, at the proposal. We'll obviously discuss the idea uh, with the Russians. And of course, we would welcome uh, a decision and action by Syria to give up its chemical weapons. The whole point of what we're doing is to stop Syria from using uh, these weapons again. But I think it's important to keep a few things in mind. First of all, uh, the international community has tried for 20 years to get Syria to sign on to the Chemical Weapons Convention, joining 189 other countries in doing so. Now it is one of only five countries that haven't done it. And just last week, uh, President Assad wouldn't even say uh, whether he had chemical weapons, despite overwhelming evidence he's actually used them. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, and of course, we've also tried to work with the Russians at the United Nations uh, repeatedly on Syria and chemical weapons for months. And uh, until now, um, they have blocked uh, all of our initiatives 
including simple press statements, never mind a Security Council resolution. So that's the background. It's also important to note that Syria has one of the largest stockpiles of chemical weapons in the world, spread across the country. It would certainly take time, resources, uh, and probably a peaceful environment to deal with this. Um, all of that said, uh, we're going to take a hard look at this. Uh, we'll talk to the Russians about it, but I think it's finally it's very uh, important to note that it's clear that this proposal comes in the context of the threat of U.S. action and the pressure that the President is exerting. So it's even more important uh, that we don't take the pressure off and that Congress give uh, the uh, President the authority uh, he's requested. Final, finally, in terms of where we are uh, with Congress, you know, my sense is this, um, from all of these briefings, uh, my sense is that when members of Congress have a chance to see the intelligence, to read it, to get the briefings, to ask questions, they come away convinced of two things. Chemical weapons were used on August 21st against civilians in Syria, and the Assad regime is the one that used them. Um, many, many members have yet to get uh, this classified brief. Uh, and now, as they're coming back uh, today and this week, uh, they'll have the opportunity to do that. And we have senior officials going out to provide the same briefing we gave last week. Uh, and I believe that when they see the evidence, it is compelling, uh, it's overwhelming. And then it comes down to a pretty basic question. Uh, are we or are we not going to do anything about the fact that Assad poisoned his own people with gas, including hundreds of children? That's the question before uh, the members of Congress. And when they have the evidence, when they see the facts, uh, I think they'll come to the right conclusion. Tony, you, 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 you said you, you're taking a hard look, the administration is taking a hard mm -hmm. look at what the Russians have offered. Does that mean that the Secretary of State, when he uh, mentioned this idea uh, in Britain earlier today, that that was a proposal coming from this administration? No, no, no. We, ju we literally just heard about this, uh, as you did, um, some hours ago. So we haven't had a chance to look at it yet. We haven't had a chance to talk to the Russians about it yet. We will. So you're aware that the Secretary said that uh, Assad could turn it over, all of it, without delay? Uh, that that was not. I mean, that seemed to set off this. No, I think he was speaking. I think he was. I believe he was answering a question, and speaking hypothetically about what if uh, Assad were to do that. And of course, we would welcome uh, Assad giving up uh, uh, his chemical weapons, doing it in a verifiable manner, so that we can uh, account for them and destroy them. That's the the whole purpose of what we're trying to achieve: to make sure that he can't use them again. That would be terrific. But uh, unfortunately, the track record to date. Uh, as including uh, recent statements by Assad not even acknowledging that he has chemical <coughs> weapons doesn't give you a lot of confidence. But that said, we want to look hard at what the Russians have proposed and we sure, will. I just want to make sure, is this, so is this an ultimatum coming from this White House to Bashar al-Assad? Is this an escape hatch for him? Again, we will look at what the Ru Russians have proposed, we'll talk to them about it, and we'll see where it goes. Peter. Sorry, if I can, just within the last hour, Susan Rice said that failing to respond would increase instability in that reason for uh, in that region for a lot of Americans the concern is that the opposite would take place in fact if we did respond that would create further instability in the region how can you assure Americans and Congress members that that's not what would take place there would be further instability if we took action well I think the the, the case is very compelling that a failure to take action uh, would produce all sorts of very, very negative consequences in terms of the interests of countries in the region, many of whom are our partners and allies, and in terms of the United States. Uh, first and foremost, we, we, we know uh, with uh, some degree of certitude that the failure to take action would say to Assad, you can use these weapons again and again and again and do it with impunity. And the more you have chemical weapons used uh, in uh, Syria, uh, the chances of it spilling over to other countries and affecting them, eventually affecting us, goes higher and higher. Second, as you know, uh, we have a real concern that countries that either have these kinds of weapons or aspire to get them will watch that, uh, and if we don't take action, they'll conclude that they can seek to acquire them and indeed use them uh, with impunity. So all of that adds to the level of risk and danger and threat to the United States. In terms of taking action, again, what we're talking about is very important to understand. This is limited, it's focused, but we believe effective in terms of uh, telling Assad don't use this again and also making it more difficult for him to do so in a very practical way. It is not going to war with Syria. It is not Iraq. It is not Afghanistan. It's not boots on the ground. And so I think the chances of uh, the action we propose to take leading to greater instability are uh, very, very, very small. To the contrary, a failure to act offers the real prospect of greater instability. So then for Americans that fear after the first few days of strikes, these limited targeted, though effective strikes, what happens on day four? five and six. What is the plan in that vacuum that could be created as a result? So you'll understand I can't get into the uh, the details of the plan. We've had an opportunity 
uh, to uh, get into this with members of Congress in a classified setting. Ultimately, they have to make a judgment. They're the people's representatives. And it's, I wish we could go into more detail with everyone, uh, but that's why uh, you have uh, elected representatives. That's their responsibility to make that judgment as well. I really want to thank, uh, you. Thank you. Discussed this with the president in St. Petersburg, this idea of international control of the chemical weapons stockpiles. Uh, so I was not in St. Petersburg. I, I was back home, so I defer that to, uh, to Jay. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thanks very much. Uh, Major, in answer to your question, we've been having conversations with the Russians uh, for a long time about the chemical weapons in Syria. Uh, the threat they pose to the region, especially in an environment, as we've seen in Syria, of civil conflict and war. Uh, and uh, this has been an ongoing conversation. I don't have a specific uh, well, conversation to, I, I don't have any more of a readout of that conversation than we've provided so far, uh, except to say that uh, Syria was, as it has been for quite some time, a subject of conversation between uh, the two leaders and all the various counterparts uh, who have engaged in conversation uh, between the U.S. and the Russians uh, over these past several weeks and months. Jay. Jay. Tony wouldn't Let do me. it, but can yeah. you explain why the American people should believe, absent the classified information you're not going to give mm -hmm. us, that you can effectively persuade uh, Bashar al-Assad not to use chemical weapons again with military strike without targeting the chemical weapons stockpiles? Mm -hmm. What we can say, Wendell, is that uh, in a uh, effective but limited way, uh, we can degrade Assad's capabilities, specifically his capabilities to deploy again chemical weapons, uh, and make clear to Assad the significant consequences of using those weapons. And I think it's important uh, within the context of some of the questions that Tony just answered, that the only reason why we have a dynamic today where the Russians have proffered a proposal and there's been some response from the Syrians uh, with regards to stockpiles of chemical weapons that they have heretofore not even acknowledged they have is because of the intense pressure being placed on Assad by the prospect of the United States uh, engaging in military force in response to Assad's use of chemical weapons against his own people on August 21st. And that is why it is so important uh, to continue to put that pressure on Assad uh, and to make clear to him uh, that a prohibition that has been pla in place in many ways for a hundred years should not be violated without consequence. And when you talk about not putting forth classified information, of course uh, there is some information that we cannot, but there has been an enormous amount of uh, inf information put forward to members of Congress and the public, and that is continuing to this day, that demonstrate uh, that chemical weapons were used on August 21st to horrifying effect. I mean, I really think it is uh, something that everyone should do, every adult certainly should do who has a concern about this, uh, to view those images that uh, were uh, shown over the weekend and I believe are available now that demonstrate the horrific consequences of that attack on civilians and in particular children and then ask themselves if they agree as every member of Congress who's had this briefing agrees the chemical weapons were used on August 24th, 21st and that the Assad regime is responsible and that that is in violation of a long-standing international prohibition should we do something about it? Should there be consequences for it? And if not, uh, what the result of that inaction would be? If I could follow that, mm -hmm. are you saying then that this proposal uh, the Russians ha have announced to, to try and pressure Assad to put his chemical weapons under international supervision is a result of the U.S. determination uh, to put to the U.S. push for military action? and? In light of that, how do you respond to I think it's very, very explicitly been stated from, that from, this uh, is... If I can finish, sure. from, from, from lawmakers who say the president got to this too late. The use of chemical weapons on a wide-scale basis occurred on August 21st, a few weeks ago. The president decided that it was entirely appropriate in a circumstance like this uh, to seek authorization from Congress uh, because we are stronger and more effective when we act uh, in a unified manner. Uh, so I do not think that this has been uh, a question of responding too slowly. In fact, in response to, as Tony said, uh, the demands and suggestions of members of Congress that uh, their voices be heard and their votes be counted, uh, the President uh, agreed. And we have engaged in an effort to present facts to members of Congress so that they can make their own assessment about uh, whether or not this international prohibition 
should be backed up and that a violation of it should have consequences. Because as, as Tony just said in response to Peter, the, the alternative is uh, greater instability. If there are no consequences, Assad gets the message that uh, he's free to use these weapons going forward. Uh, and you, what you have potentially is an unraveling of that uh, international prohibition against the use of chemical weapons uh, with potentially even more devastating consequences in the region and the world. And the Russian proposal growing out of this push for military I think action? That it has been explicitly stated by uh, Russian officials that this is an effort to avert uh, action being taken uh, by the uh, United States uh, with the support uh, of many nations uh, and hopefully with the support uh, of Congress. And so I think it's, it's, it's explicitly in reaction to the threat of uh, a retaliation for this uh, use of chemical weapons against civilians. Mara, and then Julie. Um, Today, John McCain, who's been one of your real allies in this, um, joined a kind of chorus of critics of your lobbying effort, and specifically he took exception to uh, Secretary Kerry's remark that the strike would be unbelievably small. He said that was unbelievably unhelpful. Could you explain what Kerry meant by saying it was unbelievably small? Certainly. I think that Secretary Kerry uh, clearly was referring to that in the context of what uh, the United States and the American people has, have experienced over this past 10 to 12 years, which uh, includes uh, large-scale, long-term, uh, and as it seemed uh, at least prior to President Obama coming into office, uh, open-ended military engagements with boots on the ground in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, that is the contrast that Secretary Kerry was making. I don't think that uh, the phrasing uh, reflects some error, it's, it's, a, it's a fact that by comparison, but, it, but uh, this is uh, certainly much more limited and uh, of a smaller duration and size. But the, so but the results would be unbelievably small. He was talking about the operation itself. Correct. Itself. We've said very clearly that uh, uh, if implemented that the uh, action would uh, in important ways degrade uh, Assad's capabilities and certainly uh, deter him from further use of chemical weapons. But wait, Jay, are you saying that I think it's just the White House? John, I'll get, I, I did call on Julie, and then I'll get to you. Okay. Thanks. I, I think we all get that this um, chemical weapons security proposal from the Russians may be an effort on their part mm -hmm. to try to avert military action. But I think the question is, is it also a U.S. effort to try to avert military action? Did John Kerry purposefully raise this possibility this morning as a way to try to find you know, another <coughs> option here besides the strike? I think you can. Uh, except that it is our position and has been for some time uh, that uh, the Syrian regime not only should not use but uh, should not possess stockpiles of chemical weapons and we would welcome any development and would have for some time now that would result in the uh, international control of and uh, destruction of Syria's chemical weapons stockpile. Uh, what I think you're seeing in a very fluid environment is uh, with the threat of military action, Syria and Russia, which has clearly been an ally of Syria, uh, coming up with potential proposals that uh, might, if implemented, avert military action. Now, I think it's uh, important to say that we will study this, we will work with the Russians and speak with them, uh, but it is also important to note, of course, that uh, you know, we would have some skepticism about the Assad regime's credibility, as was noted by Major, I think even as recently as in the last 24 hours, Assad has uh, refused to even acknowledge that he uh, possesses nuclear, uh, sorry, chemical weapons, which of course uh, the whole world knows that he does. But the whole world knows that he uses them. Was this a coordinated thing today with Kerry saying this first, raising this possibility, and then the Russians coming out with I'm not going to, I think, uh, what I will only say is that there are ongoing conversations uh, on this matter at the highest levels, and obviously that includes conversations with the Russians. And uh, we will study the proposal that, as Tony said, has just come forward uh, and, and see if, uh, if, there are, if there is action that can be taken upon it. But we have to be mindful of the failure of the Assad regime for so long now, 20 years to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, for uh, the last several years uh, to allow for, or at least the last uh, year, to allow for UN inspectors uh, until the last moment in the wake of the August 21st attack, and only then after they 
stalled UN inspectors for days while they bombarded the neighborhood. Uh, so there's, this is not a, uh, a history of uh, promises being kept. Uh, having said that, we'll certainly look at this and we'll certainly discuss it with the Russians. It is important to note, as I've said, that we would not be having this conversation, that any positive reaction to the suggestion that they would forsake their chemical weapons by the Syrian government would never have been forthcoming if it weren't for the fact that there is the credible threat of U.S. military action in response to their use of those weapons. Uh, John, I think I said, and then Scott. Hi. Uh, so to follow up on both of those, would the administration be willing to delay military action while taking a hard look at this Russian proposal? Well, we'll have discussions with the Russians. We'll have discussions with others. I think the Secretary General has uh, uh, made some statements today that uh, are related in the broader sense to this uh, disposition of Syrian chemical weapons. Uh, meanwhile, we are engaged in an effort to uh, discuss and provide information, discuss with, with and provide information to uh, lawmakers here in Congress, as many more of them make uh, their way back to Washington and avail themselves of the kinds of briefings that Tony discussed uh, in our effort to secure authorization from Congress. So this is not, uh, you know, this, uh, this effort is ongoing, and I'm sure that in a parallel, uh, on a parallel track, the conversations will take, take place with uh, Russians and others uh, with regards to this possible proposal. So was that a yes, that while to you're what? having, to, to, would, would the administration delay military action while taking a hard look at this proposal, well, having those discussions, you just, I mean, you're not going to start again, bombing Syria while you're negotiating with the Russians, but are you? You're, spe you're, you're spinning forward here. We've, we've just had an off, uh, a pro uh, but a, a proposal articulated by the Russians with a response of sorts by the Syrian foreign minister. Uh, as reported anyway, uh, and we'll engage in conversations about that. But we are, in terms of military action, we are obviously engaged with Congress at this point. Uh, so while we have these discussions uh, uh, with the Russians and others, uh, we will continue in the effort with Congress. And Jay, and Scott, and John and Scott, yeah. But, but the, the other sure. thing is, is this notion of an unbelievably small effort, mm -hmm. uh, in the words of, of the Secretary of State. Does the White House stand by that characterization? I think characterization I, this would be an unbelievably small effort. I, I, I think it's important here, and this goes to, I think, Julie's first question, too, to, to, to Tony Blinken, that you guys, you know, we're spending a lot of time making the case in public and with members of Congress. I think it's very clear what that case is. Uh, you can focus on phrases that uh, a senator might take issue with, but you know exactly what Secretary Kerry was referring to, just as uh, I think. Tony made clear what he was referring to in terms of the President's focus right now. Uh, the size and scope of the contemplated military action is small in comparison to what we have been engaged in in this country for the past dozen years. Large-scale, open-ended military operations in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, with enormous costs to military families, enormous sacrifice and bravery and courage, and obviously enormous financial costs. The President committed when he ran for office to end the war in Iraq responsibly, and he has done that. He has committed uh, after making sure that we focused in an appropriate way on the effort in Afghanistan, and that included plussing up our forces, to winding down that war, and he is com keeping that commitment. Uh, this is something quite different. This is a response to the violation of an international prohibition against the use of chemical weapons that would be limited in scope, would involve no boots on the ground, no American troops serving on the ground in Syria uh, in a operation that would be uh, limited in scope and duration uh, but would have a specific impact on Assad's capabilities uh, in response to this uh, abominable violation of the international prohibition against the use of chemical weapons. In the meantime, we would engage with the Russians and with others in the effort to bring about uh, the only possible outcome in Syria in terms of the civil war, and that is a political settlement. Scott. Thanks, Jay. Uh, you've talked about the need to act now to deter future chemical weapons use. Mm -hmm. Is there regret inside the White House that a, a swifter, more forceful White House response the last time chemical weapons were used in Syria eight months ago may have deterred this, this use this time? There is a significant difference between, in terms of the size and scope and impact of the use uh, that we saw on August 21st and the prior instances that uh, we assessed and the intelligence community assessed with high confidence represented the use of weapons, uh, these weapons by the Assad regime. Uh, and it is because of the uh, overwhelming uh, scope of this use, the uh, amount of chemical weapons used, the uh, breadth of the consequences when it comes to civilian casualties, uh, that it is the President's view 
and the view of many others uh, that this must be responded to, that Assad has to be held accountable. Uh, and in response to those earlier uses, we obviously took action, as did other members of the international community, in terms of stepping up our assistance to the uh, Syrian opposition, including the military opposition. Uh, but this case is obviously uh, far more egregious, as uh, anybody who has seen those videos and other evidence knows. It's not so much comparing apples The answer to your question is no. We obviously took action in response to those uh, much smaller scale uh, uses of chemical weapons. This is uh, qualitatively in the most horrific way. Correctly. Uh, and would not have been able to prevent this. I, I no believe how that you uh, we took appropriate action then and uh, in seeking congressional authorization for uh, limited, uh, limited military action now, we're, we're doing the right thing. Uh, you were asking I think I did say, Mr. Well, you, you made a, a, a slight reference to this earlier. The U.N. Secretary General mm -hmm. is, is thinking about taking this to the Security Council of transferring serious chemical weapons to safe sites where they can be stored and destroyed. Is that something you I was want just to simply responding to the fact that the Secretary General, as I saw uh, on television before I came out here, was also discussing um, the issue of the disposition of seri serious chemical weapons stockpile. Uh, to say that, that these conversations you know, are taking place uh, in the context of the threat of U.S. military action in response to the use of chemical weapons against uh, innocent civilians in Syria on a massive scale that led to the agonizing deaths of more than 1,400 people, including more than 400 children. The, uh, you know, how this plays out will obviously depend on uh, the conversations we have with the Russians and, and uh, the level of seriousness in response to those proposals that the Syrian government brings uh, to the discussions. Uh, there is not a great history here uh, when it comes to uh, Syrian credibility or the Assad regime's credibility, uh, but we would certainly uh, discuss this with the Russians as well as with the Secretary General. Um, let me give others, uh, Major, and then, and then I'll give it back, Carol. Do you want Congress to wait while you assess the credibility of this Russian-Syrian proposal? Uh, no. I, as I, I think Tony said, and others have said even in the last uh, a couple of hours, that it is precisely because of uh, the process we've undertaken in enlisting international support and the process we are undertaking in uh, making the case to members of Congress and the uh, resultant threat of military force that that has produced, uh, we are seeing these proposals. We are seeing this uh, uh, potential avenue uh, put forward. And it is because that pressure exists that we cannot let up in applying that pressure and make, and make we need to make clear to Assad, uh, as, as well as the Russians and others, that uh, we're, we're very serious about the need to respond to the violation of this uh, important prohibition. And uh, we also need to make clear that there are consequences to inaction when it comes to our national security. Uh, more instability in the region, uh, the, the threat of further use of chemical weapons, the threat of prolifer proliferation of these weapons uh, around the region and the world, and the signal that failing to hold As Assad accountable would send to uh, Tehran and Hezbollah uh, and uh, other potential bad actors when it comes to the use of these kinds of weapons. Well, the reason I ask is, as you know, Senator Manchin and Senator Heitkamp have this proposal. I asked the President about it in St. Petersburg on Friday, about a 45-day period to give the Syrians a chance to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention, hand over their chemical weapons stockpiles. These things now appear to be merging mm -hmm. in public. Is that an alternative the administration would support or would it prefer the Senate only deal with the authorization before it and consider no other matters? Well, I would refer to specific timetables. Uh, at, in the Senate to the Senate Majority Leader's office. What we are focused on is making the substantive case to lawmakers as well as to the public, and we're engaged in a broad effort uh, from the President on down to do that, about what happened on August 21st, the incontrovertible fact that weapons were used that night, chemical weapons were used that night to horrifying effect, uh, and uh, the fact that beyond a reasonable doubt the Assad regime was responsible uh, for the use of chemical weapons on that night. Uh, and. Uh, that we need to, as a matter of our own national security interest, uh, take action with the support uh, of many nations around the world and with uh, the support of uh, Congress, and that's why we're making the case. One last thing. You, uh, to the degree you're aware of it, Charlie Rose had this interview with Assad. Do you have any comment on some of the many things that Assad said about his regime, about his chemical weapons, about 
other elements of possible repercussions if there are attacks. Has the president been made aware, briefed on the contents? Because it's kind of a, we, we haven't heard from Assad mm -hmm. in this kind of extensive format. I wonder if you had any overall assessments or to the degree the president been briefed. Well, the president obviously is, is being briefed regularly on uh, situations with regard, you know, with matters with regard to uh, the situation in Syria. Uh, and uh, I don't know specifically what uh, he was uh, briefed on when it came to the Assad interview, but I'm very confident he's aware of it. Well, what Tony said in terms of the threat of repercussions is what I will echo, which is that uh, we obviously assess uh, uh, what kind of uh, reactions or actions might be taken in, in response to uh, the kind of action we're contemplating. Uh, I think Tony's assessment that uh, we do not believe it would be uh, that the Assad regime would view it as in their interest to engage in a, uh, a, uh, a war with the United States or uh, uh, and I think that's true there, too. We do not, but we will take every precaution necessary. We are very confident that we are uh, more than capable of uh, responding to or handling any uh, reaction to that uh, action. Carol. Um, last Friday, Samantha Power said that the administration had exhausted all alternatives to military force in regards to Syria. Does the White House believe that the administration has exhausted all alternatives to the military force? We have spent uh, the two years that there has been uh, a civil war in Assad, uh, in, engaging the international community, uh, trying to uh, get the United Nations Security Council to act uh, and hold Assad accountable, Russia uh, and China have blocked those efforts. Uh, we have uh, worked uh, in a concerted way with the opposition and with many partners around the world in uh, providing support to the moderate opposition, uh, as well as uh, significant humanitarian relief to the Syrian people who have been so uh, horribly affected by this conflict. When it comes to the use of chemical weapons, we have uh, made clear again and again to the Assad regime from the President on down that there would be consequences and there must be consequences to the use of chemical weapons. Uh, and that was uh, deliberate because it was, in our view, it would be a a, a terrible thing, a terrible precedent if Assad were to use those weapons in this conflict. Now he has done so, and he has done so on a massive scale with uh, all the uh, uh, horror as a result that we've seen. Uh, now that is why we are where we are, and that is why the President has been making this case internationally and why he's been making this case domestically. Uh, we will obviously, in response to what we've talked about here, uh, assess proposals put forward by the Russians, assess other proposals. Uh, but. The fact is, Assad used these weapons against his own people, murdering more than 1,400, including more than 400 children. And it, if everyone acknowledges that that's the case, as every lawmaker who's had this briefing has acknowledged is the case, then the question only becomes, should there be consequences for that? And that is the question we're asking every lawmaker uh, as they contemplate this vote. So the answer is no, you haven't exhausted all of your I, I'm not sure. I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, if you're you mean, the, the Russian proposal, then. Well, you're when she said that, the Russian that proposal hadn't been proffered. I think it was proffered in the last right, couple of hours. I'm asking, if that cha I'm asking if that changed. Is your view right now, the White mm -hmm. House's view, that you have exhausted all other options aside from military force, or you haven't? Well, I think we've answered this question because there is now, you know, this new statement by uh, the Russians, uh, the foreign minister, as well as a response by the Syrian foreign minister, and we are going to study it and, and engage with the Russians and others on it. Uh, but we must continue to uh, keep the pressure on the Assad regime with the threat of U.S. military action, because it is precisely that threat that has even led to uh, this kind of proposal. I think that's clear to anybody who's watching this. Uh, Emil, yeah. Yeah. Nadia, sorry. Uh, do you see the uh, Syrian government acceptance of the Russian proposal as an admission from the Syrian government they actually have chemical weapons because they never uh, admitted before? And second, a spokesman for the Syrian opposition dismissed the Russian proposal as a gimmick. Mm -hmm. And the State Department already said that they have doubts about the Russian proposal while the White House is saying now that they're willing to give it a consideration. Is this a contradictory? A contradictory? No, I think we've made clear that we're highly skeptical of the credibility of the Syrian regime, I'm, uh, and I think that as early as this morning, at least when it was broadcast, and so I think within the last couple of days, uh, 
Bashar al-Assad would not even acknowledge that his country has stockpiles of chemical weapons, let alone acknowledge <coughs> that his regime used them uh, on multiple occasions, most significantly on August 21st. So uh, that is uh, just the beginning of, uh, of a case for why there should be ample skepticism, and there is. Uh, but there's no question because of the potential for U.S. military action uh, that we have seen some, uh, at least, indications of uh, a potential uh, uh, acceptance of this proposal. But this is a very early stage, and it, we're obviously going to discuss this with the Russians. We're obviously going to study it, but uh, we will do so with uh, a, a certain amount of skepticism for obvious reasons. Uh, and I think the response that I've seen anyway, the public response that I've seen from the Syrian uh, government, the Assad government, is uh, <laughs> so far falls uh, fairly short of even acknowledging that the, they have these weapons. Alexis, yeah. These, the, the German government seems also to be on board with the Russian proposal. The, I'm sorry, the, would you? The German government seems to be on board with the Russian in the same proposal that apparently has been discussed during the G20, that actually there is a, a political solution whereby Assad will exit before 2014 election, which is... Well, that's separate from... Right. The, I mean, so you're I'm talking about... There's the, the matter of the use of chemical weapons and the disposition of the Syrian chemical weapons yeah, stockpile. Separate from that, there is an ongoing effort, and we work with the Russians on this, uh, within the context of uh, the Geneva uh, system that has been in place, where we are trying to bring about a political resolution to the Syrian conflict. That is the only resolution achievable that would allow for the uh, uh, Syrian state to remain in place, for the institutions to remain in place, uh, and that would uh, allow for a semblance of stability in the aftermath of this conflict. And it is our strongly held view that a leader who has massacred his own people and who has gone so far as to fire chemical weapons, sarin gas, and gas his own people to death uh, has long ago forsaken any opportunity or credibility he might have to continue to lead uh, his people. So, but that is, we are absolutely engaged in that process, and we have had that discussion and will continue to have that discussion with the Russians, as well as many other nations that understand that the only resolution to this conflict uh, in the long term has to be through a, a political negotiation. Alexis, and then Anita. Can I just follow up on two things? Mm -hmm. Can I just clarify, for those senators who are either unsure right now how they would vote this week or are reluctant to vote for approval based mm -hmm. on the resolution they've seen so far, and they come and they talk to the administration and they're interested in this potential avenue that you've described here, we've discussed. What is the White House going to tell them if they say they'd like to know more about the outcome of that potential avenue before they cast a vote this week? What's the answer? Well, again, I, I think we need to note that, as Tony did, that this, is, uh, this proposal has only recently been put forward, first of all. And we're going to study it and we're going to speak with the Russians and we'll speak with others about it and assess it. Two, we will explain to lawmakers, and I think it's a fairly easy case to make, that the only reason why uh, we are seeing this proposal uh, is because of the threat of U.S. military action in response to Assad's use of chemical weapons. Heretofore, uh, the Russians have uh, not been very helpful when it comes to, at all helpful when it comes to holding Assad accountable for either his use of chemical weapons or his Wholesale, wholesale slaughter of his own people. Uh, and certainly the Assad regime has uh, not been cooperative when it comes to uh, UN inspections uh, into their use of chemical weapons or even acknowledging the fact that they have these stockpiles, let alone that they use them. So uh, it is precisely because of this uh, very uh, public discussion and presentation of evidence that uh, we're engaged in uh, and because of the accumulating international support for action uh, that, uh, and the pressure that all of that has brought to bear on Assad that, uh, and the Russians and others that we are uh, seeing this. Uh, so we will make the case to lawmakers that we need to keep the pressure up for that reason. But you, uh, just to follow up, you would want them to cast their vote without knowing exactly how this Well, I, I think out. to, to, yes, because the vote, uh, the authorization, continues to put pressure on Assad uh, and uh, is the only reason why uh, a proposition like this would have any chance of bearing fruit. Uh, if Assad believes that there is no threat of 
uh, retaliation for his use of chemical weapons, it's hard to imagine that he will suddenly volunteer to give them up. And my second uh, follow-up question was, uh, in referring to the discussions with the Russians about the potential avenue, uh, I'm not sure what would prevent the President of the United States right now issuing an ultimatum of his own to Assad, to the Syrian regime, and saying, here's what we want to see, do this on this timetable, follow it out, follow through. I, you know, I, that's, a, that's a hypothetical. What we're seeing now is reaction to the possibility of a U.S. military uh, action and uh, a proposal put forward by the Russians. And we will study it and engage with the Russians, as well as others, to see uh, how serious it is and how, how credible uh, the Syrian reaction is. Uh, in the meantime, we need to make sure that we keep the pressure on uh, through the uh, engagement with the international community that we've uh, undertaken and through the uh, case that we're making to both Congress and the American people about why, uh, in a very limited way, uh, but an effective way, we, should, we must respond to the use of chemical weapons against inno innocent civilians. Um, Anita, yeah. Can you just talk a little bit about tomorrow's speech? Obviously, you can't give us copies yet, but mm -hmm. could you just talk about, there's been a few polls in the last day or two that show the American people are many are opposed, a lot of people not paying attention, not sure what's going on. The President obviously can't release classified information, so what can he share with them tomorrow that might help them understand what's going on? Well, I, I appreciate the question. I, I'd say a couple of things. One is, uh, it is entirely understandable that the American people and their representatives would be and are weary and wary of military engagement. They have every reason to be uh, after the sustained military action that this country has taken over the past dozen years. As a starting point, that is an entirely understandable place to be. I think that while we here in Washington all consume high quantities of the same information all the time, and we hear all of you who cover him and all of those uh, of us who work with him and for him hear the president make this case and think, well, then everybody's heard it. The fact is, as you noted, uh, many people haven't. And they may know only the headline they read or the snippet they heard on the news that uh, President Obama is making the case for a military strike in Syria. And that, understandably, uh, might raise some concern, given where we've been over these past 12 years. And that is why it is important, A, uh, to make the case about what happened, about the uh, horrific consequences of the use of chemical weapons on innocent civilians in Syria, including children, about why this is in our national security interest to respond to make sure that this prohibition against chemical weapons use is maintained, uh, and why it's important to have the Congress join the President in support of that action. Uh, so that's what the American people will hear from the President tomorrow night. It's what uh, those who heard him in his press conference uh, the other day uh, heard him say, and it's what, when he gives interviews, they'll hear him say again. And we, we understand that uh, we need to make the case and explain the facts more than once, because uh, that's the only way to reach as many people as we can. So uh, that's that's what we'll be undertaking today, tomorrow, and beyond uh, as we engage with Congress and the American public and the international community on this issue. Thanks, Jay. Jen, last one. Thanks, Jay. Um, does the President think it would be legal to launch a military strike in Syria? Uh, I think you saw that uh, Kathy Rummler addressed this in an article today. Uh, the answer is yes and legitimate, uh, a, a legitimate response. Uh, and what I can tell you is uh, the President believes that Congressional authorization uh, enhances the argument that it's important in this case because uh, of the uh, facts uh, based on the assessment given by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs that uh, we can act militarily uh, in a day or a week or a month, as the President said, uh, and have the desired impact that we seek. And therefore, given that, uh, he felt it was very important to get congressional approval, but he's also made clear that 
uh, he believes he has the authority as Commander-in-Chief and President to take action. Uh, but we are better and stronger if we, uh, in these circumstances, seek and receive authorization from Congress. Again, I would point you to what White House counsel said since she addressed this and, and, and others have. Uh, obviously, I mean, we have a circumstance here because Assad is a client of the Russians uh, that we have not been able to achieve action from the United Nations Security Council. And it simply cannot be the case that in a circumstance like that, a violation of a prohibition against chemical weapons use can, uh, will, should, should be ignored with all the consequences of ignoring that. And so the President's making his case. Uh, we obviously uh, have received international support for taking action, and that international support continues to increase. Uh, and mindful of, you know, the President's very mindful of, and we understand, the uh, wariness about this kind of action in the public and in Congress, and that's why we're making the case that we're making. Thanks, all.